Soma Gold is a gold explorer that is making some noise across social media. What truly sets this company apart is its remarkable ability to finance exploration through his own production operations, despite being just a junior player in the industry. But that's not all. They are also experiencing a robust growth that is capturing the market attention. If you are interested in a story that goes beyond the typical exploration narrative and focus on production growth, then this is an opportunity that you can afford to miss. Join us in the interview with Javier Cordova, CEO of Soma Gold Corp, and discover why this company is causing sensation. Stay tuned in this dubbed interview from Spanish. Welcome mining lovers, this is Cerlano de Minas, the Spanish podcast dedicated to mining investment, now in English. Do you want to learn? Subscribe. Do you want more content in English? Leave us a comment. The episode is about to start. Welcome to a new episode of Charlando de Minas, the first and only mining investment podcast in Spanish, today in English. Today we have the pleasure of interviewing Javier Cordova, CEO of Soma Gold Corp. Soma Gold Corp is a coal exploration and production company in Colombia, and it's listed in three markets, uh, in Toronto with the acronym Soma, in the OTC, and in Frankfurt. Javier, hello, how are you? Hello, Amadeo, I am good. Thank you very much for the invitation. For us, it is always very important to explain what we are doing with SOMA in our different operations. So hopefully we can take advantage of this time today and the investors of the worldwide related to this exciting activity like mining in here in Latin America, specifically in Colombia, people could be more aware about our work. Perfect, thanks. First of all, I would like to thank you for coming to the program and accepting the invitation. And what I'm going to ask you at the beginning is if you could introduce yourself and explain a little bit of your experience, especially for those uh, for those of the audience who doesn't know you and it's the first time that hears you. Uh, if I get it right, uh, you was a mining minister in Ecuador. Uh, could you explain a little bit how a mining minister in Ecuador has ended up in a gold project in Colombia? Yes, it is a very good question and I think it is a very good start to our story. Indeed, I am Ecuadorian. My training was more on the side of business administration finance. I was always very interested in the business world and I entered on the mining world more than 10 years ago um, in on 2008 in Ecuador, but from the public sector. At that time, I became an advisor in the Vice Ministry of Mining. And there, as I said, I entered from the public sector, from a political side, let's say. We were supporting someone, a friend who at that time was the Vice Minister of Mining, and he called me to support him in that management to make a short story. Well, there was, when I started to learn about the mining world, I found it exciting. I was, at least for some time, in different political positions. But I ended up at the end of the year 2014 as Minister of Mining in Ecuador. The ministry has just been set up. We are talking about the government of former President Rafael Correa, who had understood at that moment the importance of mining activity. And in Ecuador, there was an issue that unfortunately happened again later on. You know that Ecuador is a country very dependent on oil. Its economy depends mostly on oil. And historically, the ministries of mining were always anchored to the oil issue. Therefore, the attention of the ministers was always in the oil world. So the former president made the decision at the time when he saw the great mining potential to create a mining ministry. That is when he appointed me Minister of Mining. I was Ecuador's mining minister for almost four years until the end of January 2018 when I left the activity. And obviously I was already convinced and in love with the activity from all perspectives. And obviously I decided to continue to be linked to this industry. First as a consultant, I did some work with Wood McKenzie in different countries around the world, for example, in Igipe. 
I had visited some companies. And I ended up, to your question, I ended up, how did I end up in Colombia? Because I had met one of the main shareholders, who is our chairman of the board, Jeff Ramson, at the end of my tenure at PDEC, he actually in Toronto. And he had told me that he had this mining company, a Canadian junior that was in Colombia. I liked the approach that they had. I mean, they are now us. But at that time, I referred to them. They were very active in the formalization of small miners who had an operation here and wanted to grow. Growth also from its own activity, but also from the activity of small miners to formalization. They were very active in ESG issues, active with the communities. So it seemed interesting to me. And once I had already detached myself completely from the government in Ecuador, I advised some companies and I also began to advise this company into the search of new business in Latin America. Then I got more involved and ended up as president and CEO of the company. Well, thank you very much. Now I would like you to give a little overview of Somagorp and what are their main objectives. Look, as I mentioned to you, is a we're a Canadian junior company. We are, you already mentioned, on some exchanges like the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TSXV, and in the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, we are in OTC in New York. We have today operations only in Colombia. Now I am here in the company's office in Medellin. We are focused, although we always see opportunities in the Andean region, we believe it is an area with a lot of potential. Again, being Ecuadorian, I still think that Ecuador is a country with a lot of potential. We also see alternatives in Peru, but today we are focused here in Colombia. We own three companies in Colombia, Operadora Minera, Four Points Mining, and Izara Holdings. We have around 41,000 hectares in the Department of Antioquia in a very prolific area of Colombia, where more than 50% of the country's gold production is generated. We are currently operating one mine, the Cordero Mine. I will go into a little more detail about this mine later. When we bought Operadora Minera three years ago, we were operating two small traditional mines in Mangos, which were already in a stage of depletion. We closed those mines at the beginning of this year, and we were developing and are in full production at Cordero, which is our new mine. We are generating around 3,000 ounces of gold per month, which for us is a considerable number, even more if we take into consideration that when we bought the company, the production was around 1,600, 1,400 ounces with two mines. So the process has been complicated. We have a great team, and besides, as I said, we have over 40,000 hectares in a very prolific area. We are also betting a lot on exploration. We have a very professional, we also have a very professional geology team from where we see the company's growth perspectives. Perfect. For me, when I look at the summer goal for the first time, it was a little difficult to understand, especially because the fact that it is a conglomerate of different small companies uh, that are producing in a more or less artisanal or semi-artisanal way, uh, and then we see the whole uh, complex. No, so one of the things that I would like to do now is, uh, let's say, I give you my general overview of what summer goal is. And uh, you can tell me if I understood it well or not, if there are any corrections uh, that needs to be made. Uh, from my point of view, Somagol is an exploration and production company in Colombia, in the Antioquia region. Uh, there is a great mining culture. Uh, in this region, there are large companies like Angol, Bitugol, Gran Colombia Gol, Continent Angol. And you just say it, no? The, uh, you have one mine operating, but three subsidiaries and different exploration projects. If we look uh, from the operational point of view, you have the Bargre complex. And in this complex is where the ore is processed. And uh, it was in operating before from all mines, like uh, the Ye and the Mangos mine. And right now, uh, right now, this complex is processing almost 500 tons per day, but it can potentially produce twice as much. On the other hand, we have a mill in El Limon, which is located 45-50 kilometers away from the 
Pagre complex, where it can additionally process something like 225 tons per day, uh, which is currently under maintenance. But uh, the idea is to move that mill to the same Pagre complex to increase, let's say, the production of the whole complex. If we look in terms of uh, mineralization, mineral extraction, uh, you have the Cordero mine. That is the mine that it's part of the same complex, and that the production in 2022 was 84,000 tons. The resource indicate in ounces is about 78,000 ounces of gold, and is the infrared you have 192. With the approximate grade, let's say between 6 and 8 grams per ton, you have another product which is Nietzsche. Uh, which is further away and it's not producing right now. But in 2019, uh, there was a resource of 49,000 ounces indicated and uh, 85,000 in infrared with, uh, with a grade between 5 and 6.5 uh, grades per ton or, or grams per ton. And as far as exploration, which we will go later in detail, but you have a limon. And you have a property called Zara, which is very close to the Bagre complex. Uh, will that be more or less a good summary of the situation? Uh, or there is something that needs to be corrected? No, I think the interview is very easy. It is a very good summary, very accurate of what we have today as a company here in Colombia. Super, super, because sometimes there is so many complex and movements that you are doing and exploring. Well, sometimes even looking at the presentation, it's a little bit difficult to put it in order, everything. So we are going now slowly, understanding everything that you have. Uh, and yet is one of the things that we like to highlight. You have only been the CEO of this company for two years and a half. And there's been many changes since then. You have double production since you arrived, and I would like to know how you have done this and how you have achieved this to increase in just these two years. Look, I believe that there are issues, as you mentioned, which are key and which have been very significant and which have undoubtedly supported me a lot in the management in being able to lead the company in these, as you say, two and a half years, basically to double production. Today, we are already, we finished the third quarter, that is to say, we finished September with over 25,000 ounces of gold. That is to say, we are already above the production of the whole year 2022, which was 23,000. And at the production level, we expect to be at the target, which is approximately 35,000 ounces, which would be to double the production since we bought the company. I believe that the key has been obviously that we have been able to build first the support of our shareholders, of the main shareholders of the board of directors. It has been a permanent support to the challenges that we have had here, to the investment needs. Uh, we have made very important investments, which I think we are going to mention in the following minutes. And we have also been able to put together a very professional team with a lot of knowledge of the area, which has obviously allowed us to move forward. First, we bought a good company. We have to start there. We bought When we bought Operadora Minera, it was a company with two mines, as you mentioned, with a lower production, but it worked well with competent equipment, with good facilities. So obviously that made it easier to take over the operation. That made it easier to take over the operation and move it forward. There have been, as I said, many challenges in the sense of being able to go from the operation of two small traditional mines, such as Laie and Mangoes, which were in depletion, to develop a new mine mechanized with a new concept, new mining method to be able to put it into production. Challenging, but I think that the results speak for themselves and at the same time, and I agree with what you say, many times investors find it a little difficult. They see an interesting story in the company, but it is difficult for them to understand because we have a lot of activity, because we are a mix. And I want to be very frank, many times the investor does not understand much when I say we are a mix, we are a Canadian junior company, but we are not the typical junior exploration company that always needs to go to the market, raise funds to explore. We generate our own cash flow. We have our own operation. We have grown in production. We have a positive cash flow. We are profitable. And we use those resources precisely to invest them, not only in developing the operation and buying the necessary equipment and increasing production, 
but also using those resources for the exploration part of the company. And at times when the market is complicated, now I was, as you know, last week in London at a mining symposium. And what we all know, everyone talks a lot, investors, that the market is difficult today. It is as if they do not pay much attention to the sector. There I was witnessing many of the presentations of junior companies, which, as you know, are not paying much attention to the sector. There I was witnessing many of the presentations of the junior companies, which, as you know, are not very well known. Presentations of junior companies, which are going through a complex moment because the market is difficult today. And we have the great strength of being able to generate our own production. So as I said, I believe that the key has been to put together a very competent team that knows the area, that has been able to continue with the operation of the company, to develop a new operation, to change the mining method from a traditional mining method to a mechanized method and with all that, to be able to continue operating as we are producing. You just said that you have moved from a very traditional mining method to a more mechanized method. I would like to try to understand what you mean by mechanized and what investment you have made to make uh, uh, to make able this change. Yeah, sure. Look, when we talk about traditional to mechanized, when we talk about a traditional mining development and production, we mean that it uses conventional equipment. That is to say that it is the people, the operators with the jackets who are the ones who in a personal way, let's say, use them to drill shovels, rakes, the winches for cleaning, that is to say, to move the material because one goes out on rails to transport the ore and the tailings. So that is the traditional method that was used in the mines, Laie and Mangoes. Then to a method of low profile mechanized equipment, which is used, as you know, for subway mining, such as Yombos, Volters, Scoops, Trucks which allow us to carry out the productive mining cycle and development in a mechanized way with higher yield, of course, higher yield and at a lower cost and at a lower cost. Obviously, changing from one to the other implies a lot of things. The purchase of equipment, the investment, as you mentioned, to give you an idea, approximately, we have invested in the equipment. We bought new Sandvik equipment, Yumbos, scoops, dampers, vaulters, all of them are new equipment that have been in operation for approximately one year. We are operating them directly. So there you have an investment of approximately $6 million specifically in equipment, apart from the construction of the Cordero mine. Cost us approximately $4 million. We are building a new mine and we are working on a tailings dam that was in operation, was already in its final stage. The construction of the new tailings dam was considered, which we are already building. We are already operating it, in fact, using the new one. We have already officially closed tailings dam number two. We are in dam three, which has also cost us approximately $1.5 million to date. That is to say, we are in dam three, which has also cost us approximately $1.5 million to date. That is to say, only in these, in machinery, the construction of the new mine and the first tailings dam. We are talking about almost $12 million of investment that we have generated. So that is a little bit what we mean by moving from the two traditional mines which were the ones that the company operated from the beginning, Blaye and Mangoes, now to the Cordero mine, which is a mechanized mine with all this underground equipment, to the Cordero mine, which is a mechanized mine with all this subway equipment. If I carry it right, uh, you, we are talking about narrow veins, right? Uh, gold narrow veins. Uh, they are gold hydrothermal veins. Exactly. They are hydrothermal veins. They are narrow veins. They vary a lot. Uh, in our case, I would say they are between one and two meters with a lot of variation, of course. As I mentioned before, although, and speaking of high vein machining, which is not new for gold mining, there are many massive methods that have been scaled up at this level. And having, obviously, the geometric analysis of the body, well, of the massive of the vein, uh, an estimate is made. And that allows us to advance in all the technical economic analyses for these methods which in the end, what we have to do is to make an estimate and that allows us to advance in all the technical economic analyses for these methods, which in the end allows us to have, to provide with the use of mechanized equipment, obviously the best possible yield for the area. 
it always has to be in account that the fact that of this narrow vein. Uh, at the end, in a very broad mechanized method, you can end up with a lot of residue, no, mining uh, a small veins. Uh, and let's say, therefore, uh, if you have a lot of residue, then you reduce the grade. And obviously, it's a balance between mechanization and go much, much faster and have more residual or more artisanal. And then you have have a grade, uh, but obviously not at the same speed. Uh, you have uh, six, seven grams per ton, which are rich vein, right? But normally, this type of operation are a little bit more expensive. What is your cash cost and all include sustaining costs? Look, we approximately, I am talking about the 30th of June. We have the cash cost. It is at $900 per ounce. And all in, we are at $1,258 per ounce. Here I am considering everything. That is to say, here I am considering not only the analysis, as I mentioned, SOMA is the Canadian company. It obviously has its own expenses in Canada everything that has to do with management, et cetera. And if we take it down to Operadora Monera, which is the company that is here that operates in Colombia, well, the costs are a bit different. Different In the value I am giving you, I am giving you all the costs, including Canada. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, according to the presentation, you want to get that 43,000 ounces per year using the two mils. Uh, if that the case, the actual reserves or the ore reserves are low, right? So what is your growth target in terms of reserve? Uh, I don't mean infrared, but in terms of uh, reserves and how you are going to expand the mine, right? What are the properties, how you are going to do it? Yeah, look, our reserve growth target is based on exploration of our producing mines. In this case, I'm talking about Cordero and traditional conventional historical production mines such as Limon, Nechi and Aurora, which is a new property that we bought a few months ago where we can carry out exploration through prospecting, drilling, surface drilling. In the case of Cordero, we can carry out exploration inside the mine as mining workings, which allows us to go with greater geological certainty. We have four drills that are in operation. That is to say, as we speak, we have four drills that are in operation, two drills that are focused on our own exploration. That is to say, to generate more information and more resources in the Southern zone, which are Zara and Lyman properties, which are specifically exploration properties. And we have two drills that are in Cordero, one on surface and another one that is already drilling inside the mine precisely to be able to extend the resource that the mine has. Today, we have already reached level six. And what we want, we have not gone further down yet because this information did not exist. That is to say, when we bought the company, the exploration that Mineros had done up to now, in fact, only reached level five. We have already extended it to level six, but we are exploring in depth to be able to grow both in depth and in Sprite to the north and to the south. I mean, uh, what is the target, let's say, and if you want to say it in years of, res of reserves, how many years of reserves do you want to have? Because if you are going to increase production, so the reserves have to grow accordingly. Yes, look, I would say that we are always aiming to have over 10 years of reserves with the production more or less of what we are talking about. This year, we are going to accelerate in approximately 34,000, 35,000 ounces. Our objective for next year is to be over 40,000 ounces of production with the resources we have today, both in Cordero and Nechi. Nechi has 4,300 and 120,000 ounces since the exploration done by Mineros approximately four years ago. We also plan for next year to go and expand that exploration a little bit. That is to say that resource could eventually grow to the 120,000. We believe that obviously the resource within Cordero in the mine that we are exploring, we are producing, 
should grow and the southern zone, a historic mine such as El Limon, the new property that we bought from Aurora. Well, our objective is to have and that investors know that they have a horizon of at least 10 years of production. In the presentation, you have projections between 85,000 to 100,000 tons in 2028. This is not very far away, really, and it's a, a substantial increase in production beyond doubling the production. How you are going to do it? What are the plans? What millstones have to be achieved? This is not so far away and it is really a very substantial increase in production beyond doubling that production. How are you going to do it? What are the plans? What milestones have to be achieved? Obviously, eventually we have to grow. As I mentioned, we have to have the results of growing the resources that we have today, not only in Cordero, but also in the property to the north in Mechi in the properties that we just bought from Aurora. And this is, and in the central zone, let's say towards Aurora, this is in the southern part of our property. The northern part is where Nechi, also to the south of Nechi, but to the north of the bulk of the hectares we have is Cordero in operation. And in the middle, so to speak, an area that is very prospective is where we have great expectations of being able to generate more and more information with exploration. So without a doubt, the key to reach those production levels of between 85,000 and 100,000 is not only to be able to grow Cordero, but obviously to be able to have other mines in operation in the area. And not only that, but also, as I mentioned, we are a company that if we do not rush, because we have, uh, I believe we have a good operation today with good results, we have a large property, but we are always looking at additional projects that could be added to what we have today to reach our objective. That is to say, a corporate objective of the company is to be able to convert it in the medium term. When you talk about 2028 in the medium term, in five years approximately, into a mid-tier. Obviously, it would have to be expanded. You mentioned our plant. Our plant today is approximately between 450 and 500 tons. We have already made 500 tons 10, a very efficient plant. We have also improved the recovery when we bought it. The recovery was more or less 86%. Today, it is already approaching 88, over 90% recovery. And we, can, we have all the permits to expand it and double its capacity as the mine obviously does not generate that resource. We can expand the capacity to achieve an operation with over 1,000 tons. Let us not forget that you mentioned the Lyman plant, which is a plant of approximately 200 tons per day, which today is under maintenance. But as we have the resource, it could be expanded. That is to say, the processing capacity is basically there. It can be expanded. Today, the main challenge is to generate the resource and the necessary design for the mines to reach that level. Perfect. If we focus in Nietzsche, uh, which you said is key to get able to, to get all of this production, I think that you are currently waiting for permits, right? What are your forecasts? What do you think that you can operate there? When? Well, the first thing we have done in Nechi, as you rightly mentioned, this is a project that when we bought the company, it was already, uh, it has a 43101 uh, at the time. Mineros, which was the company we bought, a mining operator, had already made an initial development, but that was left. We had not focused 100% on advancing in Nechi because we were more focused, obviously, on Cordero, which was the closest operation. Now that Cordero is operating, now that Cordero is stabilized, let's say so, it is going, the interest is going to Nechi. The first thing we have done is that we have already worked on an update of reserves for the presentation of a new PTO, which is the new technical plan, a new work plan that has to be presented to the Secretary of Mines. We have already made this update. We will present, I estimate that at the beginning of next year, 
the PTO, that is this technical work plan to the Secretary of Mines, because the Colombian legislation changed certain parameters and requires, which is important, it requires the use of international standards to support this work plan. We, in that sense, we have already done that work. We hired professionals that focus specifically on the nature issue. We have that ready. In addition, we have already done, we have started a social work in the area and environmental work, obviously, in the area, obviously, environmental work so that the people know, so that the communities, I said at the beginning that for me, it was always important, the social focus that this company has given so that the communities know. Based on that, with all the technical, economic and socio-environmental work, once validated, it is presented to the authority for approval of the environmental license. And with the environmental license, we will be able to start with the construction of the mine. I would think to already have a perfectibility study that will allow us to present and request the permits the next year. That is to say, in the year 2024. And think about starting the construction of the mine in the year 2025. That is more or less the year 2025 for Nechi. And you spoke a little bit earlier, didn't you? Uh, when we were talking about growth, about the Aurora property, uh, there is an oil mine there. I don't know if you what you can tell uh, us about this uh, oil mine. Yes, look, Aurora is a property that we bought a few months ago. We felt that it was a part of the area. It is a property just adjacent to the south of what we had. We had always seen it with a lot of interest, and we were able to talk about what is an important negotiation for us. This is a very typical mine of the area. That is to say, it is an old mine with the same veins, narrow veins. The veins are, you mentioned hydrothermal. They are geological structures, mainly composed of quartz, milky, cruciform texture, that is to say, have typical of the area. It is what we have seen in Laye, Mangos. It is what we have seen in the south, in El Limon. And it is what we see in Aurora. They are all part of the same system in the OTU fault. So they are, they are locations, they are correlated. All these important regional faults that exist being the main one, what you mentioned, the OTU fault and its extensions. In that sense, it was always very important for us to try to expand all that area that we had from Nechi to the north, Laye, Mangos, Cordero, then came Limon, with many small operations, many years in the area, and then the property to the south was Aurora. And if you go further south, then you get to Gran Colombia with all its operations. Well, very important in that sense, we thought it was important to have it, since it was very important to have it, since it was a very important area for us to have it, since it was a very important area for us, since it was very important to have it. We thought it was important to have it. We already have it. Today, we are doing it again. We are doing social work in the area so that the communities get to know us, know who we are. We are a new company for them. We are a new company for them. They had had other companies there, but it is important that they know who we are, what we are doing to start drilling plans as well, most likely at the beginning of next year. You have explained it, and now we are going to see uh, the different exploration and um, the potential of those projects, right? Especially in the Zara property. But you explained about the OTU fault. You also explained, uh, didn't you, that you guys are always looking out for new projects or opportunities that might arise. So what is the Summer Gold strategy? Summer Gold is a company that's going to become strong following this OTU fault in some way, uh, as you are doing right now. Or if there is some project, let's say, in Ecuador or in any other country or another part of Colombia that could be interesting for the company you don't rule out uh, to have some kind of acquisition of this type? Yes, no, look, I think that something is mentioned at the beginning. We do not rule it out, if you allow me, for example, more broadly. I believe that today, yes, we are going to make our objective strong. That is why we have put so much interest and we have bet so much on the OTU fault zone, let's put it this way. Because of its location, we are in Antioquia, where more than 50% of Colombia's gold is produced. And we are basically in the heart of Antioquia. You mentioned a moment ago, the Aurora mine. And as I mentioned to you, it is strategically located north of Segovia, where Aris mining operates. 
And today that has, we, I had mentioned to you that at the beginning of next year, we already have an exploration plan to start with 5,000 meters of drilling in the area. In the area. So our interest today, without a doubt, is where we have all the properties, more than 40,000 hectares. It is an important property, but that does not mean that we are not looking at, we are in fact looking, there are things that evidently today cannot be mentioned yet, but we are always looking, we always like our objective. We do not want, we are not closed. Eventually we may not be able to look at some other sector, but we are focused on the Andean region. Obviously we like Ecuador, not only because I am Ecuadorian and have an important knowledge of the activity there. No, there are many projects with potential. There are, there are many potential projects in Ecuador. We are also looking at Peru. There are interesting projects in Peru, which is obviously a mining country par excellence. So we do not rule that out. We do not rule it out. We are looking at it and we do not rule out seeing opportunities in Colombia outside the region, outside the Andean region. So let's talk a little bit about Zara, right? Zara itself, the property, right? There is a different artisanal mining zones, Estrella, Altimon, Diamantina, Primavera, Limoncita, Canyon de Rojas. Could you say which one is more a priority and why? Look, we have already done an initial work on the property because the property, as you mentioned, Zara, it is wide. So within all that, we have already done an initial work to identify uh, according to the, you mentioned Canyon de Rojas, Limoncito, Porquera, Diamantina. They are small mines in operation that we have already been working on. We have done a work with the geologists to identify which are the areas where we want to start originally. Let us not forget that for our projects, all these would be cataloged as greenfield. Our property is wide. It extends from Zaragoza to Segovia. It covers the zone of influence of the whole area. But if there were artisanal mines, are they still considered greenfield? Well, there is no recourse there, right? Uh, uh, there is any work in terms of resource. There is no recourse. Is there. Did you do any work? Yes, exactly. There is no resource. So we took that initial information. Some have operated until recently. Others have been abandoned for a longer time. So there is no resource. Most of them have been done. There is no modern exploration work, let's say, but drilling much less. We always enter in coordination with the communities or with these old mines. We enter to the geologists. It allows them to take certain information and from that to develop, we have already been Limoncito. We have already been in Canyon de Rojas. We have drilled Diamantina. We are today focused in the Porquera zone. Then we have already observed extensions of mineralization in the Porquera zone. We have already observed extensions of mineralization that include, I mentioned Lacron, it is a mine that we reviewed, Diamantina, they are targets that extend along two kilometers in this same fault. We have already identified a second trace with a length of approximately one kilometer where additional mines are found such as Primavera, Lamada, outcrops have been identified that also suggest us the possibility that this same mineralization has extended those prospects that are in the Segovia area are today in prospecting information gathering. This will allow us to have much more focused and much more efficient drilling in the next months. Also in areas now that we have Otukas and Otukas where we have a lot of mineralization. In areas now that we have Otukas to the south, also with the information that we are getting, it will allow us to have a much more focused exploration plan. Now, within Sarah that you mentioned, to be more precise in that, the exploration priorities are in the traces, so to speak, which include Limon, Alacran, Diamantina. It is a very well-defined train, which we have already determined 
On the opposite side, there is another train, another trace that is in Primavera and Estrella. These are two places that the team has already defined, and that is where we are starting to focus with the drills. In terms of exploration, right? If someone walked into Soma Gold today and a year from now, what answers will they have? Or what answers do you want to be answered in a year from now in terms of exploration? Well, what answers do you want to answer a year from now in terms of exploration? Look, what I would like to have in exploration within a year is much more defined what I mentioned to you. That is, we have an important property, a very prospective property. We have already managed to gather a lot of information. We are going to run a geophysical process. We have already worked on identifying these different trends that we have in the area. The objective in a year's time would be to have much more defined in each one of these zones, what we have, what type of resource we could have there, so that from there we can start adding, as you rightly mentioned a few minutes ago, if within the production plan that the company has, we visualize in five years time to have a production of over 80, 85,000 ounces. That is to say to double, we have already doubled. We have already doubled the production in five years time. We have already doubled production as complex as we know it is from 17,000 to basically we expect 34,000 more this year. To reach those levels, we would have to double today's production and a little more in the next five years to double it in a little more in the next five years. And for that, we already need to have much more defined where the new mines that we could put into production will be mines like Cordero, mines like Nechi, mines like Persis, that we can find an expansion in depth of lemon, reactivate the Aurora mine, etc. But not only those, but as to mention the different premises in the Alacran, Diamantina, in Primavera, and in the zone of, in the south zone, also in the Canyon de Rojas, and in another place. Perfect. Now let's focus a little bit on economics. You are not only an exploration company, you are also a production company. If we take a quick look to the financial statement, uh, we uh, do see that you have approximately 30 million in debt. Could you explain to us uh, where that debt comes from and what are the terms for them? Yes, look, the 30 million of debt that we have from the one is 5 million of debt related to the financing of the equipment. I had mentioned at the beginning that we purchased new Sandvik equipment, and that is debt related to the financing that is done on a monthly basis. The difference in that, approximately 25 million of debt, is that the company has a historical relationship, let's say, with our major shareholder, which is Glenn Walsh. With his company, Glenn, I mentioned that perhaps one of the main keys to achieve the result we have had here has been the support of all the investors, without a doubt, but mainly of the two investors who have been with the company since day one, founders of the company, and who have invested their own resources and who today hold approximately 70% of the company's shares. I'm talking about Glenn Walsh, Jeff Hampson. Jeff Hampson is the chairman of the board today. That our debt is the debt to Glenn, to his company, which at the time was there for a loan that was made by the company so that it could, whoever started and whoever could operate. It's obviously, as they say, so to speak, it's debt, but it's a friendly debt. It's debt to our major shareholder. So the conditions that we have managed so far have been positive. If you consider approximately the adjusted EBITDA that we had this year, in the first six months of the year of approximately $6 million, I would say that it is a debt that we can handle. We should begin to pay it according to the original conditions of next year, but our idea would be to begin to pay it by the end of this year, precisely to begin to assume that debt, which is important because of the flow that we are generating, and precisely to begin to assume that debt, which is important. Perfect. You have uh, 
talked some uh, a little bit about the partners, and you have said that you have uh, two major share shareholders who have practically 70% of the company. I'm wondering at this point, if you have a significant percentage of the company, if there are any other institutional in, in, uh, as a shareholder. We have, I have a percentage. I do not know how important it is, but I obviously have a percentage of shares in the company. The great majority obviously is in the two, and there are some non-important institutional investors. The great majority is in the float. It is, that is to say, of the remaining 30%. I mean, we have some important investors, investors in Europe. In fact, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange has more liquidity and moves more than the stock exchange of our stock well, in Toronto and investors in Canada. Perfect. There are approximately 5 million of warrants at uh, 66 cents. I am wondering if you think that this might be uh, a limit for the share price to going up, and if those warrants are exercised, uh, what do you will do with the money? Uh, what are you going to use it? Look, those warrants, effectively, I would say to you that uh, from my point of view, if they have acted in the last, uh, if you analyze the investment price in the last weeks, weeks, maybe in the last two months, I would say that they have acted as a kind of stopper, effectively, because the price has always been around those levels, but it had not been able to surpass it. I would say that part of it is those warrants. One cannot stop considering that this is a real option. However, look that in the last few days, we finally managed to overcome that cap, so to speak. On Friday, we closed at 73 cents, I think, between yesterday and today. It has been, it has remained at 73 cents. Yesterday, it reached 74 cents. So it would seem that we have managed to overcome that. If those warrants are executed, which is the plan, we are working on it. If those warrants are executed, which I believe that if they are kept at this level, they will obviously be executed. I would say that the plan is the plan will be the same, which is what we have always done. That is to use those warrants to reinvest in the company. They could be used. It is not an issue that is defined. We would have to define what is the best use for those resources that would enter the company. We have, as I mentioned at the beginning, many plans in terms of exploration. We have many plans in exploration matters. We have, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have many plans for exploration. We have four drills. We are still developing Cordero. We are building the plant. We already have the Glen debt, which as I mentioned, we would like to start preparing at the end of the year, before the end of the year. Continue a little bit in the economic plan. You are a company that you are generating a profit and you should increase notably with the ramp up of the production um, and, and more thinking about the increase that you have in mind and you have planned. In the projection, it seems clear that in the second quarter of 2024, uh, the cash flow starts to be important, and also with the reduction of debt. Do you expect in any way that the market uh, will react to that? Or why hasn't done it yet? Because if you look to the company, comparing to pairs and neighbors and so, it's a significant lower multiple than them. What do you think... Oh, what has the market not seen yet uh, in SOMA? Yeah, look, I think I asked myself the same question, to be very honest with you. But no, look, I think there are several factors. As I mentioned to you, I was listening to it last week on Friday, between Thursday and Friday in London, one of them. And I mentioned it to people as important in the mining world as people as important in the mining world as Frank Joostra, to give you an example, or the CEO of Wheaton. At times you feel that the market just doesn't care. I mean, it's not just us. We are at a point in time where it seems that the market just doesn't. It would seem that the market does not pay much attention to the companies in the industry despite the fact that in our case, what you mentioned, we are an industry that, we are a company that is generating positive cash flow. 
that we are profitable, that we are exploring, that we are giving palpable real results, like basically doubling production in a couple of years, I would think that the key here will be consistency. We have been consistent and I believe that the market, although obviously I would like it to react faster, but it is reacting. If you look at the evolution of the investment and if you look at the last 52 weeks, if you look at the measurement of the last 52 weeks, the lowest level we reached a year ago approximately was 22 cents. And that, yes, it was because we had a union strike a year ago. We were we have a union in the operator. We were negotiating the new contract. Then, unfortunately, sometimes a very normal way, let's say it like this, of the unions functioning, they went on strike. We had a stoppage for approximately two weeks and the market hit us hard, but we reached 22 cents. Today, we are at 73 cents. That is to say we have achieved in 52 weeks. I believe that the evolution is positive. I believe that if we continue to be consistent with the operation, we continue to be consistent with production, the market will react. And also the other thing, that is why we talk so much and we focus so much on exploration. And here I also want to be very clear. I believe it is important to expand our resource base. That is to say, we need to increase the value of our resources. I mean, I believe that the market also wants to see and investors want to see. They tell you, well, very good. You have a good production. You have improved your production. You look positive with your cash flow. You are profitable. But until when you are going to have at this level of production, you are going to have an operation for two more years, three more years, for two more years, three more years. Or are you going to have a sustainable production when I can see, well, 10, 15 years of production? But I would believe that if we continue at the levels we are at, if we continue to be consistent with the results, the market will continue to react. I say continue because I believe it has reacted well in recent months. The project is located in Colombia, and it's a country that has changed for first time in the last year of a government to the to the left. How is the country? Uh, have there been any kind of changes that affect mining? Because usually in Latin American countries, when the left rise, normally there was always fear to the change, you no, know, and fear to change towards mining legislation. Look, I do, without a doubt, without a doubt, he generates a lot. I personally experienced it in Ecuador as well. I'm going to leave Colombia for just a few minutes. Ecuador also at the beginning of the Correa government, its way, its visualization towards the mining industry was very negative. And that to say it in a way, basically erased Ecuador from the mining map. It took many years for the government itself to understand that the industry is not an easy industry because it is a long term industry. It is an industry that if you see it from a political perspective, it does not give you political benefits in the short term. It is an industry that unfortunately is the truth. It is very criticized worldwide for environmental issues, social issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you put me here in Colombia, yes, with the new president, not so new because he has been here for more than a year, but that always generates expectations. Now, to tell you that I have seen significant changes or that really the impact in the sector, so far, no. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. It was at the beginning. The day after President Perto took office, he sent a tax reform that in some way, as it was originally presented, would have been stronger. Perhaps it did not come out as strong as expected, but it has generated some impacts on the tax part for the industry. So far, we know that the government is analyzing environmental issues, some labor issues. But in practice, we have not seen anything else. But going a little further, I must be very honest with you. I mentioned again the subject of London. Uh, you see in London, in projects in different parts of the world, in Africa, obviously here in Latin America, etc., because they are long term projects. And in the long term, we are going to have to deal with different types of governments, governments of the left, governments of the right governments that are more focused or that pay much more attention to the subject of foreign investment, governments that perhaps focus in another sense, 
For us, the key is to continue contributing positively to the development of the country and to the development of the areas that historically have had a lot of limitations in terms of economic development limitation, to continue contributing to the generation of employment, to continue being very responsible with our tax payments, to continue being very responsible with our environmental issues. We like not only to comply with environmental regulations, but to be above environmental regulations. This has led us to be awarded two consecutive years by Antioquia, which is the environmental authority that regulates us. So I would say that I understand, and it makes me very much this question of how we see our situation here. We are calm. We have not really seen our operation impacted by the new government, and we are always willing to adapt and comply with the regulations imposed by the governments, who obviously are the ones who regulate the activity. Thank you very much, Javier. I think that we have done a good review of the company. We have been able to present it to the audience. And I think that really have a very promising project in your hands with obviously some clear objectives to be met. Uh, but that the market is starting to see, is starting to wake up for summer. And I hope that we can talk again soon to follow the evolution of the project and see all of these objectives fulfilled. If you want the last minute to address to the audience and potential inversors, the audience is all yours. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much to you for the invitation. And yes, I would love to always be able to follow up to let people know about us. I think we have a very good operation here in Colombia, a very good professional team. I think it is all about people. And I come back to your initial question. What has been, so to speak, the secret of what has been achieved? The secret of what has been achieved here is the people, the staff that is motivated, appropriate conditions, working, being part of the community, that the community also supports the work. So I hope that we can continue to meet the objectives for our investors, obviously to generate a return for our investors, which is key in our process, but at the same time to be able to continue to work in the right conditions, to work, to be part of the community. Key in our process, but at the same time also to continue contributing to the development of Colombia, of the communities and within all of that, to continue growing as a company. We would love to continue to be watched with attention and to be able to have these spaces where we can communicate. Thank, Thank you very, you much, very much to you. Disclaimer. The content in Charlando de Minas is not an investment advice. Amadeo Bonet and his guests are not investment advisors. The authors may have interest in the companies mentioned in this publication. They may also have bias and not be impartial. The information in this publication and all the others in Charlando de Minas is impersonal by nature and should be considered as an entertainment product. The minimum risk of any investment mentioned in this video is 100% of the capital. Before to make any investment decision, contact to a financial or investment advisor or someone qualified with experience. This broadcast are a narrative of my learnings in the world of commodities and mining investment. In this podcast, we will try to bring experts, professionals and companies. If you like it, please subscribe. I am Amel Bonet. Welcome to Charlando de Minas.